start here at this uh, right now. Well, class, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Herb Beatty. He's from the Nature Conservancy in Tulsa. And uh, I don't know a great deal about his organization, but I understand that he has been uh, uh, very, very committed to it, to saving and preserving lands in Oklahoma. And he has, uh, it has been with the Conservancy. Did you begin it yourself? Uh, I started the Oklahoma chapter. Okay. Well, I'll just let you tell us about who you are and what your mission is and, and all that. So I'll just let you get started. Excellent. How many of you have heard of the Nation Conservancy? Typical. We need to change that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I'm here today. You are going to hear about the Nature Conservancy. We are a private, nonprofit corporation. Uh, with a single mission of identifying and protecting the best of the natural world. We're an international corporation headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, although we're global, at least in theory, in practice, our activities are restricted to the 50 states, Central and South America, and island nations in the Pacific Ocean, not in Africa, uh, Asia, or Europe at the present time. In foreign countries, we don't own any Typically what we do is we acquire critical natural areas of protecting for the biological communities that are there, in particular, with a particular emphasis on uh, threatened and endangered species. Because we're non-confrontational, non-litigious, because we avoid ethical issues, <laughs> we have uniquely among the conservation groups attracted a lot of corporate and foundation money. We are wealthy. We have about $200 million in a revolving land purchase fund, which we uh, which we borrow from, for example, we borrowed close to ten million dollars to acquire thirty-five thousand acres in Osage County, which you'll see about here in a minute. My job, along with the board here in Oklahoma, is to go around and hustle money from all sources to try to repay the loans. The money goes back and revolve, and we do another deal another day. But nobody really quarrels with what we do. We're generally applauded. Um, and, uh, but we're quite uh, not very well known. And toward that end, we want to have more Oklahomans know who we are, what our mission is, why it's important, and, and therefore, KOTV in Tulsa, KWTV in Oklahoma City, Phillips in <coughs> Tulsa World, PSO, and Stegman Productions, uh, a producer of television specials, put together a what we call a Last Great Places in Oklahoma campaign, the centerpiece of which was a half hour special. But I'm, now I'm getting into the, if you'll turn on the tape, please, we'll, we'll uh, let it tell you our story for about 30 minutes. Be sure to watch the Nature Conservancy's Last Great Places on KOTV Channel 6. Here's the question. Do you ever get fed up at work? Counting down the days to your vacation? 
have a hard time with the boss, Oklahoma driver Scott Thompson shares your anguish and thinks he has found perhaps the perfect place to escape it all. He's at the Nature Conservancy's Tall Grass Prairie Preserve up in Osage County, along with some folks who count butterflies. Nora Jones, Vern Lejess, and Cody Arends are off to another day's work. They share their office with brown-eyed Susans, butterfly weed, the yellow sulfur, and the goat weed emperor. Oh, to be so lucky. Nora is the Nature Conservancy's Director of Science. Cody is a Nature Conservancy intern, and Vern is a volunteer from Illinois. They've come to the prairie to count butterflies, to keep track of the colorful insects that flit through the grasses. We might be familiar with the monarch that we see uh, in the fall, but uh, you say there's at least 30 that have been documented in the past week here. In the past, about past month, we've been working on the list, and we expect to find between 60 and 65. Three quarters of the animals on the tall grass prairie are insects, but the butterflies, these painted ladies and eastern blue tails and red admirals, serve as more than just a streak of color against the sky. They are the barometers of how this delicate place is faring. We use them for indicators, and uh, we would see the decline in the butterfly before we'd see the decline in the plant. And they are more sensitive to pollutions and things of that caliber where we would notice them a lot faster and be able to try to pick up if there's a mistake being made. The only mistake we make is launching our butterfly hunt against a stiff wind under overcast skies. Butterflies prefer a windless, sunny day, but it's not all disappointment. Pearly crescent. Butterflies live for just weeks, and in many places, including suburban yards, they just don't seem to show up as often anymore. Our search for the perfect lawn is denying us the pleasure of their company. It may have to do with the fact that they're using um, certain pesticides that may be harmful to the, uh, to the larvae or the caterpillars. Um, it may be that they aren't planting native plants, which is uh, the food source for the larvae. Planting a patch of coneflower or milkweed can make it easier for the butterfly to come home to our homes. Meanwhile, the count will go on out here on the prairie because these little fairy sprites have a role to play because they matter. Essentially, if you lose one, we'll have lost a beautiful species that plays uh, an important part in the ecosystem maybe that we don't understand. It could be food for birds, food for other animals, which depend on that, on that species. Um, we just like to save as much of it as we can. On the tall grass prairie, Scott Thompson, Channel 6 News. Friday night here on Channel 6, you can find out more about the Prairie Preserve, where the bison will be released this fall, and the other Oklahoma sites managed by the Nature Conservancy. It is called The Last Great Places. The program is here on Channel 6 at 7 o'clock Friday evening. In addition to the promotional materials which show on television, we got excellent coverage on the news media all across Oklahoma. At 7 p.m. on June 25th, the uh, following special appeared on CBS outlets all over Oklahoma. It was available to 98% of the homes in Oklahoma. This special presentation is brought to you by Public Service Company of Oklahoma, the Tulsa World, Phillips Petroleum Company, and KOTV Channel 6. I've walked beaches all over the world, and this reminds me of that. The open horizon, the waving, wind-driven patterns in the grass, like whitecaps in the ocean. It stretches your imagination. That's something you need to do here. Walking over these plains, you come upon depressions like these, wallows where, over <coughs> thousands of years, the bison rolled in mud to remove insects and shed their heavy winter coats in the spring. Their numbers were so great they changed the landscape. And now, now they are gone. In a few short decades, the tens of millions of bison that roamed across the plains of North America were reduced to small remnants like these, 
on the Adams Ranch outside Bartlesville. It was only through the foresight of a few people, a few families like the Adams in Oklahoma, that we can see them at all. There are few places where they live in a natural environment. Attempts by the National Park Service to establish preserves in states where they ranged, such as Oklahoma, failed. It appeared the ancient relationship between bison and grassland was destined for memory and legend. It appeared they would exist only as stock animals, like bees. The spirit of Oklahoma, however, proved larger than the obstacles. Our chapter of the Nature Conservancy convinced the cattlemen, the oilmen, and all the other interests that had blocked the federal government that as a private preserve, purchased with private money, it could work. The Nature Conservancy has launched a $15 million private campaign to ensure that the bison will again be joined in their ancient relationship with the tall grass. Designated one of the last great places by the Nature Conservancy, the restoration of the tall grass prairie by the Oklahoma chapter is receiving national attention. It is indeed a unique and expansive ecosystem. I'm Clayton Vaughn, and in the next half hour, Glenda Sylvie and I will explain the purpose of this multi-million dollar effort, as well as the organization behind it, as we explore the spirit of the last great places in Oklahoma. in the world to live here and to have the, the job as director of the Oklahoma Chapter of Nature Conservancy to protect the great diversity of Oklahoma, which runs from the Wachita's in the southeast and the cypress and the alligators to the Rocky Mountain species in the northwest and then, of course, the prairies and the Wichita Mountains and the Ozarks. We've got wonderful diversity in this state. Still here, still able to protect it. The rewards that you get from seeing even one species be more successful because you're involved in it are overwhelming. And not only that, but the rewards of helping to show the public, um, the landowners, all these other people that they can make a big difference in nature just by doing a few things that really don't cost much, but by using common sense, um, by just trying to keep nature the way it naturally should be, definitely is a big reward. Our victories are real. Uh, when the Conservancy protects a piece of land, uh, you know, it's a real victory. You can go out there and roll around on it. You know, it's, it's a real concrete sort of thing. It's not a political uh, sort of victory that can vanish you know, with the next Congress. I'm Glenda Sylvie, and as the concern for preservation has grown around our state, so has the Nature Conservancy. Its first purchase in Oklahoma was Redbud Valley near Catoosa in the late 60s. Its beauty, its importance as a small, diverse edge of range habitat, was established by a biology professor at the University of Tulsa, Dr. Harriet Barkley. She also helped with other Nature Conservancy scientists to develop a natural heritage inventory to identify plants, animals, and ecosystems that needed protection if they were to survive. The strategy then was to use private funds to purchase small areas such as Red Light Valley for preservation. Joe Williams, chair and CEO of the Williams Companies, was an Oklahoma chapter founder and remains a conservancy leader. Well, the Nature Conservancy in uh, its nationwide configuration has, has migrated from being a preserver of small tracts uh, with acquisition as its only methodology uh, to being a scientifically driven uh, definer of large-scale uh, bio-reserves, recognizing that ecosystems uh, are what really need to be protected. I think the concept of how we relate to the Earth, how the Earth we inherited, <coughs> we with it and we pass on to future generations is fundamental to the concept of all of us. And historically, in the past, our mainstream Judeo-Christian 
faiths that taught us that we should have dominion over the earth and all the creatures of it. And this implied some kind of domination, some kind of superiority. Within the past five years or so, I've noticed that most of our religions in the United States are talking about stewardship, part of that dominion over the creatures of the earth. And I think this is a significant change. It's one that's necessary. It's growing every year. You find dedicated volunteers like Joe Williams and professionals like Herb Baby all over the state. Each speaks with a sense of urgency and passion about conservancy. It is home, Oklahoma. You can visit the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve year-round. Visitors may obtain free brochures for self-guided driving and walking tours at the headquarters. For a free guide to all the Nature Conservancy Preserves, call 1-800-628-6860. Two miles north of Kenton, you can stand on the highest point in Oklahoma at the Black Mesa Preserve. Here, you can also view 31 rare species and four distinct community types. For a free guide to Black Mesa and all Conservancy Preserves, Call 1 800 628 6860. When the Conservancy was founded about 50 years ago, we were preserving areas that were aesthetically pleasing or that were favorite study sites for certain scientists. As we matured, we realized that our mission could be a little bit better focused and that we could target areas that needed our protection and that needed. Uh, specific management, uh, rare plant sites, for example, where, uh, let's say, the area needed to be burned periodically. There was not another agency that was willing to take on that kind of responsibility and long-term management for sites such as those. So the Conservancy shifted to a science-driven approach. I think by the Nature Conservancy being science-driven, it makes our conservation efforts much more powerful because we're relying on objective, hard scientific information to determine what's, what's needed out on the landscape in terms of conservation, rather than relying on uh, what the latest you know, hot topic is or what's, what's sexy in, at the moment. Science tells us that the largest and most productive ecosystem in North America is nearly gone. Tall grass prairie once covered millions of acres of the richest soil in the world. In a few decades, beginning in the middle of the last century, it was turned into the richest agricultural area in the world. Our civilization is based in large part on the wheat, corn, and other grains produced in this area. Its productivity benefits us every day when we eat our cereal or sandwich. However, in rapid transition, many secrets of the prairie were lost. Really, the, you know, the breadbasket of, of North America is primarily on what used to be tall grass. And those soils were all developed and maintained under native vegetation until just in the last century or so. So yeah, I think learning how the original system used to work, how those, those native plants and animals interacted, how soils were developed, um, how nutrients flow through those systems, uh, learning how that learning how that system operates in a in a native natural situation um, will will probably or likely have some some agricultural purposes or benefits also. I think it'll be a very very interesting uh, experience for them. And I think eventually they want to take up all the inside fences and just have a free ranging herd of, of bison there to try to replicate three or four hundred years ago without a lot of fencing. And, and I think it will uh, benefit even cattle to a large degree on how they need to improve their uh, pastures based on what they're doing over the tall grass prairie. I really, I really believe that. The booming mating call of the prairie chicken the crackle of fire, followed by the thundering of bison hooves to eat the new shoots of life poking through the blackened thatch, speaks to us of a beauty 
and an urgency about the tall grass. As Bob said, we have a great deal to learn about these relationships, but we have a great deal to learn about many other places in Oklahoma. This is the Oklahoma Natural Heritage Inventory in Norman. Scientists catalog rare and endangered plants, animals, and ecosystems from all over the state. This program, and others like it in each of our 50 states, was started by the Nature Conservancy. The science here not only helps the Conservancy in its work, but also business and government. For example, if an oil company is proposing a pipeline, it can call the inventory and determine if any endangered species or ecosystems will be disturbed by the route. This saves a great deal of time and money while preserving our natural heritage. One species that the heritage inventory helps to catalog is the interior least tern. <coughs> this bird winters in South America and then returns to the Mississippi River system to nest on sandbars and raise its young in the summer. Damming, dredging, and other activities along the river system have drastically reduced their nesting habitat. The tern was listed as an endangered species in 1985. One of the last free-flowing rivers in the central U.S. is the Canadian near Oklahoma City in Norman. The tern's protection here by a broad partnership among the Nature Conservancy, private landowners, the local chapter of the Audubon Society, the state of Oklahoma, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and municipalities such as Norman is a model of conservation. No one group in ourselves are, are going to be able to do this work. We need to do it together. And, um, and that's exactly what we're doing. Volunteering is a happy experience. You can come out to a preserve and give back to the community and give to the land in a positive manner. And today, with as many negative things as there are about the environment, you can come out and get really involved and have a positive experience. Partnerships are the way I think it's going to have to go with uh, making a difference for habitat preservation, restoration, whatever. I think we're going to have to work together. And it certainly has worked with uh, this particular project. <coughs> There is excitement over seeing the least terns return from their long journey to nest on the Canadian River sandbars. It is the result of three years of patient coalition building and education. Landowners along the river were contacted by Nature Conservancy people and Audubon volunteers. They were informed about the endangered least terns and invited to join the Oklahoma Natural Areas Registry, a special statewide program which recognizes landowners who make a voluntary commitment to protect the significant natural features of their land. Participants in this project sign registry agreements, giving conservancy people access to their property to monitor and help protect the birds. Registry agreements are non-binding on the landowners. However, it seems that the education, the knowledge that they can make a difference for the future with just a few changes in their stewardship brings about change. There is excitement and pride in the work. I did it because we enjoy the bird. My wife and I, especially my wife, she's really into the what's and birds. And, and uh, we like for other people to enjoy them, and so we want to protect them if we can. If we get one landowner to cooperate with us, it's much easier to get the landowners near him or her to cooperate. They definitely have a network they definitely talk to each other. Um, sometimes it's a matter of pride. You know, I've signed up my land, um, or I've heard Mr. So-and-so signed up. How come I haven't been asked to sign up? A similar program is working along the Arkansas River to protect not only the least terns that migrate from the south in the summer, but the bald eagles migrating from the north. The Nature Conservancy professionals know that animals like the tern, the bald eagle, the bison help to focus our attention, but it is the ecosystem we must conserve. It is the quality of the river habitat and water that must be improved 
to benefit us as well as the birds. It is the same with the sea of tall grass in Osage County. Fully restored, the tall grass prairie preserve may provide us with ways to improve our agriculture, our medicine, and the quality of our lives. Besides these benefits, the tall grass is also a model for future preserves on how current economic uses can be blended with conservation. The bison will graze next to the pump jack, and in the adjoining pasture, there may be cattle. Jack Graves, an oil producer, adamantly opposed a national park. Gary Rollins is the president of the Pahuska Chamber of Commerce. Both are committed to the conservancy's approach to the tall grass. Uh, to use illustration, uh, fire control, uh, range management, those are very important things uh, in that uh, the uh, largest cash crop for the county is cow-calf operations, and consequently, um, uh, having the Nature Conservancy here uh, as neighbors that's cognizant of those needs and, and desires uh, within the county is, is most in, uh, important to us. But I like the mannerism. I like the way uh, they put first things first. They don't piddle around with insignificant things. And in my opinion, the tall grass prairie is very significant and is something that uh, I wish everyone supported. You can enjoy the acrobatics of the interior lease term, an endangered species, at the Conservancy's Canadian River Lease Term Preserve near Norman, Oklahoma, or the Arkansas River Lease Term Preserve in Tulsa. For more information regarding the Nature Conservancy's preserves in Oklahoma, call 1-800-628-6860. National Wildlife Refuge is four and a half miles south of Broken Bow. When you visit, you'll see 15,000 acres of magnificent floodplain land and forested hillside. Hiking, <coughs> birding, fishing, and hunting are available at this preserve, which is owned and operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Call 1-800-628-6860 for a free guide to all of Oklahoma's preserves. One of the statistics that I like uh, most is it's just the elevation of the difference between the southeast corner of the state, which is less than 400 feet of sea level, the Black Mesa and you know, the tip of the Panhandle, which is almost 5,000 feet. I and mean, that's a heck of a bungee jump if you put them all together. Just the climate and the topography lends itself to, uh, to different kinds of vegetation and, and so forth. So uh, it doesn't take much to get me excited about the entire state. And here is the Black Mesa, located in the Oklahoma Panhandle. Black Mesa is the eastern edge of range for many Rocky Mountain species of plants and animals. Oklahoma, because of its location on the continent, is very diverse in this regard. The Conservancy bought the Black Mesa with private funds. A permanent conservation easement was put on the deed, and then the property was sold to the Oklahoma Department of Tourism for management. In this way, the Nature Conservancy was able to assure long-term protection for this important habitat, while at the same time freeing up important private funds for other conservation projects. All Nature Conservancy funds come from private sources, which has a number of advantages. The beauty, the wonder of being private is that we don't have to go through the political process. In order to do a deal, we need to get the approval of our board of directors and a few internal procedures. We do not have to take that before the voters. We don't have to take a decision like that before people who have to stand up to the voters. We can take uh, a natural area out of the political process forevermore. This is the Cucumber Creek Preserve in the Washita's in the far southeastern part of the state. This area and surrounding forest are an important habitat for many species of neotropical migratory songbirds. During the breeding season in the spring and summer, 
the rugged peaks and deep valleys become inhabited with a brilliant variety of birds. The Nature Conservancy established a preserve here to protect this habitat for the birds and other rare plants and animals. The creek bed is home to a rare salamander, and on the surrounding hill and banks, more than 16 plants that are rarely seen anywhere else in the state. Mapping and inventory of this area are critical to its conservation. We just do not know enough about our great places in the state. And if we are to preserve them, we must all work together to understand and learn what we have. Stewardship is, is forever, and it covers lots of dimensions. But I think there's three aspects that I'd like to discuss. First is, is preserve design. Uh, we have to clearly understand what it is we're trying to do at any given place. What are the species of concern? What are the threats to that species? Then there's the business of active stewardship, of erecting fences, of prescribed burns. And then there's the monitoring process by which we count at the proper time of the year in predetermined places, whether it's a straight line through the preserve or a square area that's been aligned where they go in and count the number of each plant that's there, uh, the number of insects, and in order to establish trends and population changes over time. With just a moment of reflection here at the headquarters of the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve, it's easy to become committed to conservancy in Oklahoma. We live in beautiful space, a beautiful place that will continue to nurture us and our children and our children's children if we are but good stewards of these last great places in Oklahoma. For a free guide to Nature Conservancy Preserves, call 1-800-628-6860 or write. Once you learn about the work of this organization and how you can help, you'll be moved to join in the effort with your time and money. The Nature Conservancy is first and foremost a problem. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, any comments? Um, this is a course in ethics. Uh, I think I'm one of the fortunate people. First place, I think that less than 10% of the people who have jobs they really enjoy what they're doing. I really think I believe I'm on an ethical mission trying to save the best of our world for your grandchildren. Um, when I knew I was going to be talking to a business ethics course, there were a couple of thoughts that I thought I'd share with you. The first was, back when I was hired in 1986, there was a high degree of agreement among all the national conservation organizations, the U.S. Park Service, that the tall grass prairie was the largest ecosystem in North America at the time of White Settlement. You know, 100 years ago, all grass prairie was here, 142 million acres, and it's gone. And uh, the U.S. Park Service has a role of identifying and protecting the best of the natural world so that you and your grandchildren can go and learn, enjoy, and appreciate the natural area. Uh, the only significant area uh, that's not protected by the U.S. Park Service is the tall grass. And uh, so my job in 1986 was to try to get consensus among the Oklahoma congressional delegation and uh, the local folks to, uh, to create a national park. It was generally agreed that Osage County, northern Osage, north of Husky, was the only place left in North America that wasn't all chopped up, farmed up, paved over, and what have you. That was the place to do it. And, uh, there was really no debate on that. Um, ultimately, we got the uh, Oklahoma delegation to introduce a bill in the Congress of the United States to create a national park. That bill was a big compromise between the cattlemen who graze cows up there, Osages who own the minerals under Osage County, the oil producers who produce oil on the, on the place that it was identified as oil all over Osage County. It was a compromise. The Nature Conservancy was unique in that we supported, without qualification, the, uh, the bill as introduced. Now, there, was no, there were going to be cows walking all over that national park. 
And as a biologist, I know that that's not the way that you ought to run a, a, a tall grass nat natural area. It ought to be, cows ought to be removed. They're, they're not native at all. You ought to get, reintroduce fire and bison. And, uh, and, but I gave my unqualified support. It was tough, because I knew better. But that's what the Nature Conservancy does. We're non-litigious, non-confrontational, and I had to stick into our little niche. All the other, Audubon Society and the Sierra Club and the others were saying, we got to get those cows off of there and we got to somehow control the, the uh, well, uh, the practical politician in me said, there's no way we're going to remove the cows in the, uh, in the uh, with federal money, we'll remove the cows and stop the oil and politics of Oklahoma is not going to permit that to happen. And uh, so I would say to my friends at the Sierra Club and Audubon, you guys better stop that noise because if you keep it up and if the threat of removing the cows and shutting down the oil, that's there. I guarantee you we're not going to have a national park and that's exactly what happened. And then the Nature Conservancy moved in and we bought the place on Friday. And we have removed the cows. We, we judge that the the oil is no problem to us, and even if it were, we couldn't control it because the minerals are superior to the surface in Oklahoma in most states. So we now have a very neat uh, nature preserve. We're in the business of trying to raise $15 million, which is a tough job. Um, the other ethical thought I'll share with you is that I am almost 59 years old, and I have been reading about the natural world all my life. And I know that, uh, that uh, at present there are more people on the face of this earth than this earth can support sustainably. That I know that we are reducing the earth's ability to produce food. We are over harvesting the seeds. We, are, we have agriculture going on in places which cannot be sustained like the Central Valley of California which is rapidly coming salt and we're going to have to in your grandchildren's lifetime, California, Central Valley, is not going to be able to produce anywhere near the kind of food that it's doing right now. Um, we in Oklahoma have seriously, have seriously um, depleted the Ogallala aquifer out in the Panhandle. You know, we pumped all that water out, and the depth of that groundwater went down and down and down, and shut down the uh, pivot irrigation out there. And this, this is going on worldwide. Worldwide, we are reducing the world's ability to produce food, in the meantime, we're producing a population that has exceeded the uh, world's ability to support that population. A lot of people are going to starve. There's going to be a lot of misery. Globe. We're telling third world countries, look at us. Uh, you know, if you developed your country the way we have developed our country, then you can be like us and you can consume all the good stuff. We can all have your cars and drive to school every day, like I'm sure every one of you came to school. A car today. That's not going to work globally. It's just not going to work. There's just not that a lot of resources in the world. By working for the Nature Conservancy, I can't say that. I can't talk like that. We're the good guys. We're the white hats. All we do is identify and protect natural areas. I can't talk about difficult issues like depletion of energy resources, like depletion. Of I read this morning's paper. Globally in the U.S., we, we've got a pending. Uh, crisis with regard to potable water. In your lifetime, you're going to be hearing a lot about water. Fortunately, we live in a wonderful place. We're relatively uninhabited. We've got relatively good resources. The problems of overpopulation are going to show up in Oklahoma uh, a lot later. I mean, they're look, I mean, that's really the issue in uh, Yugoslavia today. That's really the issue in Somalia. That's really the issue in, in China. There's too many people. I can't talk about with that, I would hope I have engendered some thoughts regarding ethics. No? Nobody's got an idea?
some of those things that you said you cannot discuss as far as the mean, Stuff like acid rain and, uh -huh. and uh, I have a good friend. I have a good friend, John McCandless, who's an attorney over in Oklahoma City, and he said, this is a recent conversation we've been having. Um, Oklahoma has a big hazardous waste disposal facility, a place called Lone Mountain, just outside of Eden. And 90% of the stuff that gets incinerated there at Lone Mountain is imported into Oklahoma. We are taking lots of other states, hazardous wastes, and bring them into Oklahoma. That alone doesn't bother me, but John has all kinds of evidence of the fact that that place is not working. They got air quality problems with toxic materials coming out of that stack, and they're also leaching stuff in the groundwater out there. And John calls and says, her, we got to do something like this. And I have to say, John, <laughs> the environmentalist part of me says, yeah, but I can't do it as long as I work for nature. So we're not going to tell those industrials that they're doing the wrong thing. That's not our stuff. John McCandless, an attorney in Oklahoma City, would be wonderful if he could get the morning. Um, I wonder. What, what about uh, the animal know. rights uh, position? <laughs> that is kind of funny. Um, when the Nature Conservancy, get the closure. The Nature Conservancy um, has a preserve in Hawaii. Now, when white men got to Hawaii, there were no mammals bigger than rats. The whole lot. There were no animals of any size out there. And so um, one of the critters we brought along was, uh, was pigs. Pigs, uh, domestic pigs, have uh, one of the things they're selected for genetically is to uh, reproduce large, you know, large litters frequently. So, uh, what has happened in the Hawaiian Islands is, is we have a big problem called feral pigs, wild pigs, domestic pigs gone wild. And uh, the problem is that there's a lot of plants that evolve there in the Hawaiian Islands which cannot stand up to the pressure of pig raising. I mean, they're very destructive of native vegetation. And some of those volcanic islands are rugged and remote, and, uh, and without a predator, there's no wolves, there are no coyotes, there's no mountain lions, there's no predators to, to, to eat on those uh, pigs, and their populations just explode and they ruin the <coughs> plants. What we have done is we have instituted a um, process by where we are trapping, as a last resort, the Nature Conservancy is trapping pigs in the local line on. We know of no other way to eradicate them. We can't get enough guys to go out there and shoot them. No other way to do that. Yet. Similarly, in Oklahoma, there are a number of species that, as we brought cattle and as we uh, suppressed fires, fire was a natural part of the phenomenon out here until white selling. As we have suppressed fire and brought cattle in, lots of species, including a bird called cowbird, uh, have come with the cattle. We, got, we're, we have a non native species called cowbirds. But they, their trick is, is they like to find a, a native bird, in this case the black cat vireo. They find a black cat vireo nest and they'll drop a uh, cowbird egg in the vireo nest. And uh, if, that, if that cowbird egg hatches, and it does, the cowbird is a lot bigger than the baby vireos. The vireos, parents will come along and feed the cowbird, you know, and the cowbird will grow and crush the baby vireo. No, once a, cow, once a cowbird egg gets put in a vireo nest, the probability of vireo baby surviving is zero. So what we're doing in Oklahoma is we're going out and we are trapping those cowbirds and we are killing them. People for the ethical treatment of animals thinks both of those things are awful. And so they uh, are going around and saying the Nature Conservancy are bad guys because, it, because they are killing, in, in killing, murder. These animals, they shouldn't do that. It's unethical to treat animals so often. And uh, our position is that uh, we think the diversity of life on this earth is important. Vireos ought to survive. This is a last gasp effort, effort for us to protect an endangered species. It was kind of funny. We, they, if PETA came and protested at our annual meeting in South Carolina, this 
year. I hope you people know that General Schwarzkopf was in Oklahoma. You know, you have to know that he was here. He was here because he's one of us, and he was at our Tall Grass Bird Preserve dedication, which got a lot of national coverage here October 18. Anyhow, we were, in one hand, we were fearful that PETA would show up and protest when Schwarzkopf was here. On the other hand, there's some cattle who resent the fact that we have removed cattle from 30,000 acres in Osage County. You know, they think the land was there to be made productive and that the highest and best use of those, those of all the available grasslands in Oklahoma would be to produce beef so you can have a McDonald burger tonight. And that's their position. We, we think there's ought to be room for, for everybody, including us. We were kind of hoping that if either one protested, they'd both protest because Peter likes, well, dislikes cattle a lot more than they dislike us. <laughs> what um, would be the conservancy's position about hunting? We have no problem with hunting. Uh, it's, it's fine. Uh, uh, of course, we would, uh, would encourage appropriate game laws uh, so that you don't hunt to extinction. You know, I resent the fact that, that, that I can't look at a passenger pigeon. Yeah, either. I mean, they were here in millions of them. They're gone. We almost uh, wiped out the bison. There was, there were, there, 200 years ago, there were grizzly bears here in Oklahoma. We not, we killed them all. There were wolves in Oklahoma. We killed them all. The fact that we cannot uh, use them, see them, enjoy them, I think is wrong. It was an unethical thing on the part of our forefathers, and we certainly won't tell them to deny our children the opportunity to use all species for food, for medicine, for enjoyment, for education. This is very much of an interdependent world. And how all these relationships of other species work together, we don't know very well. It's kind of really arrogant and stupid to annihilate species and before we understand how all these things work together. Appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you. You'll probably do it.